Welcome to Retro Groove. I'm Adam C. And I'm Liam D. And this is a podcast where we talk about music that stands the test of time, the albums and artists that have shaped and reshaped the sonic landscape, as well as covering new music from those artists. Happy New Year, everybody. And this is a special edition episode. Um, This is not going to be a normal numbered episode of Retro Groove. Uh, today, and this this should uh, go live on the very last day of 2021. Thank goodness we ma- we made it through mm-hmm. somehow. And uh, we're going to do something uh, a little different, and we're going to see if it works. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, we'll change it up next year. That works. But um, first, we're going to run down uh, our top albums of the past year. And then we'll see if we can come to a consensus. And it Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if we do or don't, but we're going to try. Sure. Uh, But then we're going to go back in time a little bit, and we're going to hop back by decade. So we'll talk about 2011. We'll talk about 2001, 91, 81. And we're going to go all the way back to 1971. Um. I think going any further than that, we would probably run out of time. And Mm -hmm. also, you know, my kind of uh, expertise stops a little kind of in the mid 60s. Yeah. Uh, I'm real fuzzy and not really well versed on anything that happened um, other than the major breakthroughs and things like that uh, prior to, you know, the early to mid sixties. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to go all the way back to 71. Uh, but first what's up, Liam? How was Christmas? Uh, it was pretty good. You know, I uh, had a little family come to town, but tried to keep it minimal and safe. Uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a good time. It was actually kind of restful. Usually, um, my father-in-law comes to visit and, uh, he comes with a bunch of projects in mind to do on the house that I then get roped into doing. And uh, this time we he came and we all just kind of chilled. We did some like light stuff around the house, but it was uh, it was pretty quiet. How about you? And we're we're talking about John Lennon, right? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the John Lennon. <laughs> well, if you if you didn't hear the most recent episode. Uh, Liam's stepfather's name is literally John Lennon. My father-in-law, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> father-in-law. Um, so, uh, yeah, we pretty much the same. We we kind of kept it to ourselves. Um, uh, I actually just found out today that um, uh, my mom had visited her uh, stepdaughter. That's where they went for uh, Christmas. Mm-hmm. And the very next day... Um, the stepdaughter tested positive for COVID. Oh, so no. yeah, and they're not feeling great. So yeah. I'm like, oh my god, they're you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everyone's getting it, man. It's crazy. Yeah, they're they're fully vaccinated, so I'm pretty uh, confident they'll be all right and boosted as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a crazy time. You know, they just I just uh, posted about the news earlier today that they they canceled that spoon. New Year's Eve bash, which was probably going to be an amazing show. Yeah. Uh, It's unfortunate, but it's just what we're going through right now. Yeah. They killed a bunch of shows. They, they killed, they killed fish usually does like a whole run at MSG. They scrapped all that. The strokes are going to play in Brooklyn. Um, yeah, everything's getting shut down. Yeah. Here we go again. Yeah. But what'd you Um, get, man? I got I got some video game stuff. I got some games I, that I was looking to get. Um, and then uh, my wife got me a uh, a Lego set, a Fender Strat and amp uh, Lego Lego set. That's pretty neat. Um, that's cool. So I just finished up the Mario question block. Uh, that was like oh, yeah, yeah. my project during uh, the break here. And so now I'm going to like kick this one off with my daughter and, and see what we can get awesome. done on, on New Year's. 
How many pieces is that one? It's like a thousand something. Ooh, yeah, it's a pretty yeah. decent sized set. It's a project, yeah. That's um, cool. And we just watched Star Wars. We like. I was trying to figure out which Star Wars we could show her at six, and we, I landed on like the first first one, like the fourth one technically. Yeah. Um, and it's got those iconic characters that she's kind of seen before but doesn't know who they are um and so she is very into it she wants to watch more but there's a lot of star wars lego so yes uh, and they're not slippery slope no no so we're gonna star wars legos are expensive (laughs) we're gonna pump the brakes a little bit and uh (laughs) maybe we'll get some sort of x-wing and and leave it at that yeah how about you very nice um it was it was you know as a dad it's usually uh, you know you just want yeah. the kids and everybody else to just have a good day. Um, my kind of little surprise came after Christmas. Um, I, I, I posted a more detailed story in the, uh, in the discord, but, um, you know, since my divorce, my, my ex-wife and I have worked really, really hard to cultivate a solid friendship and Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, really cool, especially for the kids. But, you know, it's nice to be able to get along with the person that, you know, you kind of has to be in your life yeah. because you've got kids together. Right. Um, but we we kind of just n- never stopped buying Christmas presents for each other. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if it was just habit or like, you know, we're trying to be cordial and be friendly and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, and our friendship has has improved drastically, which has been great. But it's good. Um, I didn't get one from her this year. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay, you know, I wasn't upset by it necessarily. It kind of makes sense. I was like, oh, we're not going to do that forever. Right. Um, but then I kind of had to run over and, and help her out with a, a little minor crisis mm-hmm. um, a couple days ago. And it, uh, it would have been like the 20, 28th. And uh, I was, I was, Finishing up and, you know, got the kids tucked in and put to bed and everything had calmed down. And uh, she was on the phone, so I was going to kind of sneak out and I waved. And then I noticed um, a cardboard box in a very familiar shape. Yeah. (laughs) That flat cardboard box that's about, you know, 13 or 14 inches square. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of, she was on the phone, so I didn't want to be rude, but I kind of motioned to it like, like was that you know what i mean yeah and she, and she kind of mouthed like oh that's for you sorry it's late oh well, my and god I op- <laughs> and i opened it up and it's portis head the music on vinyl pressing of the pnyc uh, live at roseland ballroom in new york and nice. that album I-, I love that album and i'm not typically one for live albums it's not my thing i don't like to hear the crowd cheering and stuff like that yeah. it annoys me but that album that may be okay. It's definitely in my top three favorite live albums, but I absolutely love that album, and it's been on my wish list for like two years. Okay, so is it hard um, to find? Like, is it out of print, or it's just pricey? I don't or? know okay. if I don't know if it's out of print. Um, but it's if if you look on Discogs, most copies are going for like forty five dollars plus. It's not it's not the kind of thing that you can typically just pop into any record store and it's available and find it. yeah yeah so you have to you usually have to hunt it down so right um yeah she did a good job <laughs> awesome that's <laughs> yeah, so cool it, it really warmed my heart and it and it really it was a good christmas anyway but it really was like the cherry on top of my christmas so yeah um but yeah that's about it have I'm you just listened excited to it for yet? the new year no i'm actually still <laughs> i have not gotten my setup um, uh, connected and everything at the new place. Yeah, my vinyl it. is still in boxes, uh, and uh, it breaks my heart. But I'm I'm still trying to get some furniture pieces. Yeah, uh, that I need yeah, to get, get it, it mapped out first. How I want it. So, you know, the the receiver isn't hooked up, and the vinyl is still in boxes. I need it. I need a. The sh- I can't really f- use the Calax in this space. Right. Unfortunately, unless I go with like the t- the smaller one, like the two by two. Okay. Um, but then, but then I would need another separate furniture piece for like maybe the turntable, um, because I can't really fit both the turntable and the receiver on top of the two by two Calax. Mm-hmm. So I'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, anyway, 
I, I, I cannot wait to listen to it, but I haven't listened to it yet. So with all that said, we are going to skip a lot of the normal, um, segments that we do on the show. This being a special, you know, album of the year, uh, cast from the past episode if you mm-hmm. want to call it a little that time time warp yeah time warp but first <laughs> we're going to start with 2021 uh it's been a crazy year an interesting year um some really incredible music has come out this year you know we we kicked off uh the premiere episode of the podcast talking about the black keys album delta cream mm-hmm. yeah and i think that deserves a mention um but a lot of really really cool albums came out this year and uh, Liam, why don't you kick it off and and tell me what kind of your handful of of most memorable albums were this year? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. It's it's crazy that it's hard to s- narrow it down. <laughs> so much good music came out of all this. I mean, you every artist kind of works at their own pace and in their own environment, and some thrive in this, and some uh, I think got yeah. a little uh, knocked to the side. Um, Given all that, to see how much great stuff came out this year is uh, incredibly impressive. Yeah, um, I I loved the Soul Sonic album. It yes. um, it was long awaited. Uh, I feel like that was a victim of COVID and probably would have come out last year. Uh, but it it is so good. I've thrown it on a bunch of times. I said it on a previous episode, but I just wish that I had that on vinyl. I still haven't seen it. I I haven't hunted. Did they press it? I don't know. Yeah. I haven't really dug around online, but, um, but I had a strong feeling you were going to mention this album. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it's something I look for every time I go into my local record store just to be like, yeah, I wonder if, they finally pressed it. Cause again, you do have that delay in a lot of these things where stuff mm-hmm. came out and then, um, six months later it actually shows up on the, on the store shelves. Um, so, so that was great. Uh, I talked about Manchester orchestra a bunch. That album's gorgeous. Um, Lord Huron yeah. put out a fantastic album this year. Uh, I, I loved the snail mail album, the Courtney Barnett album. Um, but, I, I landed on two that kind of duked it out, and and I have a verdict. Uh, okay. Know, do okay. You, do you want to do you want to shout out some of yours first, or do you? Yeah, we can do, do it that do way. This? Also, uh, real quick, the yeah. Silk Sonic album does not have an official vinyl pressing as of right now. So man. You can stop looking for That's it. Crazy. <laughs> at le- That's at least it, so it crazy. seems tailor made so for that kind of format, but maybe yeah. maybe w- it, exactly. it's highly possible it's due to all of the you know delays that we're seeing in that manufacturing yeah. uh, segment. But hopefully we get it at some point. Um, I've only done a yeah. cursory listen, but I, I need to dig back into it further. Um, but yeah, so for so for fun. me. The, the ones that I put, I, I've loved what I heard. I just haven't really gotten to dig into it, unfortunately. Um, and I love fun music like that. Really enjoy it. Um, so the albums that I had in my honorable mentions, um, and then it's it's still kind of down to three. And believe it or not, I have not made a final verdict yet. So I'm going to try to do it on the fly as we mm-hmm. talk about it here. Um, but my top albums, um, I think that... Uh, Tyler, the creator needs to be mentioned. Um, his call me if you get lost album Mm -hmm. came out earlier this year and it's uh, pretty amazing. I wasn't really, he wasn't really on my radar, uh, before this year, but kind of with you talking about him. And honestly, I think it was, it was you talking about Tyler that kind of got me interested. Um, but I, I went back Mm -hmm. and listened to that that whole album and man, it's really good. (laughs) Like it's, it's an incredible album. Um, I think, uh, despite the fact that I don't really, it's not something that I, uh, actually two of these, not really a genre that I listen to, uh, regularly, but Adele deserves to be mentioned. Um, it's, Mm -hmm. it's just, it's an incredible album and, um, she's really, really, I mean, she was amazing before, but she's she's almost kind of the biggest artist in the world at this point. Um, I think we've yeah. already touched on that in, in previous episodes. But 
Um, her 30 album deserves mention. Uh, this one's kind of, maybe it counts, maybe it doesn't, but I definitely think that Taylor Swift deserves a mention. Um, it's, it's the, her, her, her own remake of her own yeah. album because yeah. she wants I mean, to Red own. I mean, Red is so good. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's not something that I really listen to, but, um, I think the consistency in her songwriting and just her achievements deserve to be recognized. And the fact that she, I think this is unprecedented. I, I have never heard of, and I don't think any artist has ever done this before where they literally go back and re record their entire previous catalog, you know, due to ownership reasons. Right. You know, she wants, she deserves to own her own music and, on, you know, due to some of the crazy legal, um, <laughs> you're, you're probably more familiar with that world than I am, but, um, you know, she doesn't own those songs. Yeah. Um, so re-recording them kind of gives her at least ownership of those new recordings. Yeah. So major props to her. I think it was a brilliant move. And um, it, it deserves to be mentioned. Um, also have Snail Mail on here. That was one of my top three that I'm still struggling with. Um, the other two that are rounding out my top three are Collapsed in Sunbeams by Arlo Parks. Mm-hmm. Um, going back and listening to that reminded me of how it affected me when I first listened to it. And I couldn't stop listening to it. Yeah. Like I, I tried to like skip through it really quick just to like remind myself and I literally could not make myself press that button to go to the next song. Yeah. It was just like completely captivating. Yeah. Um, and the last one, uh, rounding out the top three for me is uh, Crawler by Idols. Um, and it's, it's an album that had just ended up uh, gripping me and I haven't been able to put it down, bought it on vinyl. And uh, I, it hasn't lost any of its potency. Um, you know, sometimes an album gets you on the front end and then you kind of lose interest, but I'm, I'm getting bits and pieces that I, that I haven't gotten on previous listens. And it's, uh, it's a heavy hitting album. It's brutally honest. And my top three are really coming, coming down to, uh, a lot of really honest, Mm -hmm. um, songwriting. And, and I feel like idols is kind of that brutal honesty. Snail mail is kind of that creative honesty yeah and arlo parks is kind of the poetic honesty and um do you so what what do you think your number one might be well so i'll go back to the arlo album first i mean yeah that it's gorgeous it's striking it reminds me of when i first heard uh, like Phoebe Bridger's first album, and it was mm-hmm. just there was something fresh about it. They don't they don't sound alike. They don't write the same way, but there was just that like that fresh air feeling of like oh my gosh, this like something important's happening right now. Yeah, um, definitely. And then in in the Phoebe sense, you got the collab with Connor, and then her second album last year, and that was the the second album was just like smash like just Mm -hmm. like everything realized and so for arlo like i love this album but it makes me i feel like for me it sets up what could happen next um yes Mm -hmm. and and i feel like that's actually gonna wind up being a theme in a lot of mine is like 100 percent i'm i'm almost predominantly going with artists who are a little deeper in their catalog um so for me um, the, the two that, uh, that are, have been duking it out is the Tyler album and, uh, and Yola's album stand for myself. Oh, nice. And, and I think I give it to Tyler. Ultimately the, the mm-hmm. Yola album is her second. It isn't entirely what I expected her to do. Like if you were to say, what is this next album going to sound like? I would have thought, maybe more in like the Stevie Nicks vein of things. And instead Mm. she's just like full on fierce with some disco, but like, yeah, it's this, it's this crazy blend. She's such a badass, And, um, 
fortunately, again, given this year, I actually got to see both of these artists live. Yeah, um, you mentioned and that. Both of them were fantastic live. Like both oh, of them man. had this great presence. Um, but the Tyler album. So again, for me as a fan from a while back, mm-hmm. it is the full realization of what you've kind of seen his Genesis be where you can hear the lyricism, but it was like a in the early albums, it was this like punk rock extremist, like he's just trying to get a reaction, but the chops are there. You like the yeah. talents, the talents there, but you hear it's from coming from a teenager and he's like working through all this stuff. And then by his like third, fourth album, I mean, he produces almost everything himself. We talked about that at one point. Like yes. he, he doesn't really work with other producers. There's a handful of example uh, of exceptions to that. Um, but you can hear his influences in Flower Boy and Igor, where all of a sudden, like, it's not really hip hop anymore. It's soul. It's R&B. It's it's alt pop or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And and so, again, like this is album six. You, you could be seven if you count his first mixtape. And like everyone expected it to continue in that trajectory and just get weirder into that R&B space. Yeah. And uh-huh. instead he co- he goes back, he's rapping better than he's ever before. His lyrics are mm-hmm. better than they've ever been before. The production yeah. the the production is so good and yep. it it feels it's such a weird thing cuz it's like a throwback to mixtapes from like 10 15 years ago and honestly mm-hmm. like I don't like DJ DJ drama that much. He's kind of obnoxious and <laughs> he almost ruins the whole thing for me but because <laughs> it, because of like the format of what Tyler's building here, it's like he brought Lil Wayne and he, and he brought Pharrell and he brought DJ drama. He brought all these people like into what he was constructing. Mm. And there's this mishmash of sounds and influences and styles, and it's very choppy, but it's cohesive. And it feels like it could go off the rails at any point, but the guy's got such a handle on what he's trying to create. It is wildly impressive. It is just like... Definitely. And it's so easy to put on, like, in the car or whatever. It's, It's... it's fantastic. It's just as I looked at the year and I tried to figure out like what I kept consistently going back to, like there were other albums where if I was feeling melancholy, if I was feeling sad, uh, if I was feeling bright or whatever, like I would go to these other different albums. But the Tyler album, I just it was like Run the Jewels for last year for me, where it was just like I just yeah. kept coming back to it. I could not mm-hmm. stop putting this thing on and just cruising around and going about my day so i i'm gonna give this one to tyler nice nice well deserved yeah um that kind of feeling of this could go off the rails at any moment but it's always kept together uh i i love that from an album and i I feel like the idols album has that Mm -hmm. um in that same kind of aura whatever you whatever you want to call it um where you know it 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 feels like it's gonna fall apart or you know go go completely left field um but they they keep it together and it almost gets better and makes it better and this is album Um, four right uh you say the third or fourth album or something like that I don't remember off the. Yeah. I, it's around there, yeah, three or four. It's, yeah, but it's. It, I mean, they're they're established at this point. Is yeah. the thing. Like again, oh we're, yeah, they tour like, worldwide. They're yeah, they're yeah. this band that has figured out their sound and they're getting into it and they're getting comfortable and they're experimenting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, however, speaking of idols and um, major props to Snail Mail, it real that album really really surprised me, um, but. You know, as I said, I was going to do this off the cuff. And um, like you mentioned, something that um, is going to be a recurring theme, particularly as we look backwards, because, you know, hindsight, it it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm giving it to Arlo Parks for this year. And when, when we go back and look at previous decades, one of my major deciding factors was, okay, which of these albums was almost like 
psychic in a way, like, like painting a picture of what the future was going to look like in mm-hmm. the music world. And, um, for that, you know, obviously I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know, but I'm giving it to Arlo parks for that reason as well, as I yeah. feel like that's the direction, you know, even when you look at p- purely pop artists, like, Olivia Rodrigo or something like that yeah. where they're, they're getting really, really transparent and really honest. Like w- the culture is really, um, savoring and, and craving sincerity. that transparency, sincerity and, and, and pure honesty. Yep. And so I think, I think Arlo n- nails that. Um, but it's also just, as heartbreaking as it is, sometimes you can you can see yourself in it, you can see your own life in it, but it's yeah. also profoundly poetic, and I, I just love it. So yeah. uh, I'm giving it to Arlo for 2021. Cool. Um, so sh- should we shift backwards ten years and just keep hopping that way, or do we want to go all the way back and then work our way forward? I'm thinking we work our way backwards. For I, for this very reason, I noticed I noticed some patterns here. Mm-hmm. So as I'm looking at you know the albums, the major albums that came out this year, and then I started looking back at 2011. Both years had releases from Kanye West, mm. Saint Vincent, mm-hmm. Adele, Foo Fighters, The Black Keys, Radiohead. Well, okay, Radiohead. If you count the Kid A Amnesia with the with the new collection that right, may or may course. not count sure sure but uh war on drugs my morning jacket tyler the creator all of those artists i just listed had releases in both 2021 and 2011 <laughs> and actually i think that was tyler's first album was 2011 or it was 2011 or, yeah goblin first official album yeah um so i thought that was really interesting <laughs> and so for that reason i think i think we should work backwards um, I, I agree. I mean, initially when we were talking about this, I figured it might make sense to go all the way back and work forward. But then when I looked at 71, the number of iconic albums that were released yeah. that year, <laughs> like, I think we're going to have a bunch of, uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about in 71. Yes. And I feel like that's a good culmination. Um, yeah. You know, usually like the newer stuff is more exciting to talk about in many cases, but I think 71 is going to get real interesting. So, yeah. Um, so let's hop back uh, 10 years. Yeah. T- 10 years <laughs> ago. Yeah. 10 years ago, I was still living in New York City. Um, I had just gotten married and uh, there was some really good music coming out. Yeah. Um, So you mentioned the Tyler album. I loved Goblin that like I first Mm -hmm. saw him at South by Southwest in Austin um, with Odd Future right around then. And it just blew my mind. Um, Mm -hmm. I love El Camino. I love that album so much. I think we determined, or at least I determined that it is my favorite Black Keys album. Yeah, I think we did. Ultimately. Um but uh, and there's a bunch of other great ones. I mean, there's there's uh, Florence put out ceremonials that year, which was awesome. Um, yep. There's a great Decemberists album that year called "The King Is Dead." Like they had a oh, hit. Yeah. They had like a breakthrough hit initially, um, but like "The King Is Dead" was the like I, I think that that was like the epitome of what that band was doing blending mm-hmm. indie rock and folk. Uh, I love that album. I still go back to it from time to time. Um, but for me, I, something kind of going along with what you were just saying, you mentioned St. Vincent and Adele. Um, there was a Beyonce album this year, which was really good. Um, I think Born This Way by Lady Gaga was this year. There were great albums from Feist and, and like mm-hmm. you said, Strange mm-hmm. Mercy from St. Vincent. I, like, We've mentioned it in other episodes, but women for the past few years specifically have just obviously dominated most music, most yeah. songwriting. They are just like absolutely crushing it and putting dudes to shame. Definitely. Not that it's a competition. Mm-hmm. No, um, but I mean, you're, you, it is what it is. You're right. It's, it's been, it's actually been really cool and refreshing to, to see 
Um, cause I have to be honest with myself, my, my preference generally, if I'm thinking of something to put on and, and I'm thinking about a, something for the pure vocal aspect of it, uh, I, I generally tend to prefer hearing a woman's voice. I yeah. don't know if it's more soothing to me for whatever reason, I have no idea, yeah. but, um, I, I love a lot of the, you know, new perspectives and, um, you know, seeing, I even do it with games. You know what I mean? My daughter mm-hmm. will walk in I'll be playing. Um, I don't know. What was it recently? I was playing the, uh, Oh, I was playing Phoenix rising, uh, mm-hmm. immortals. Yeah. And my daughter was like, why are you playing a girl character? And my, my answer was like, well, I, I'm a dude all the time. I might as well when I'm doing something, yeah. you know, creative or make believe why not get a different perspective. Heck yeah. So, uh, uh I've had kind of had that, um, perspective on it for for a while and for me that star actually started with portishead to bring it back around oh wow um, okay i remember you know listening to portishead and tori amos as well to a certain extent mm-hmm. uh and then a little bit later fiona apple but uh man um that first um time listening to to portishead and hearing um you know her perspective on being a woman, it's like, oh, it was it was real, just really eye opening for me for whatever reason. So yeah, yeah. I'm all for it. You know, the I, future's female, whatever you want to call yeah, it. I, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, mean, I have I have two daughters and no sons, so the future's female for me anyway. <laughs> Let's yeah. just keep it rolling. <laughs> but there's but it's interesting because you you can look back and you can see so many powerful women in oh absolutely music over the years and and. Even the era that you were talking about, Alanis and Gwen Stefani and Shirley mm-hmm. Manson, mm-hmm. like we we had so many great women uh, in music, but there was it, as I looked back at 2011, and then I kind of looked at the years following it, and I was like, I feel like there was a pivot point in 2010, 2011. You had I, I, like these, like it was just consistently fantastic yeah. women dominating all of the kind of breaking pop trends, all of the interesting stuff. Um, and, and so for me, I think it's Adele's 21, like, which seems wow. like, it seems like right on the nose, right? It seems like the easiest thing to say in that year, but I went back and listened to it in prep for this and it is ridiculously good. And like, it's so good. You, you look at like, Everyone who was influenced by her and the impact that she has had. And now we look at this year where the world stopped when she dropped her new album five years after the last one. And like, right, it's it all kind of started with this. 19 was great. I remember hearing Chasing Pavements and I was like, wow, this is this is special. Who is this artist? Yeah. And then 21 just clubs you in the head and is just like, no, that this, this artist is undeniable. Yeah. You will be talking about her for the rest Forever. of your life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes. And it's weird. Sure. Like when I listened to it, like I forgot, I remembered obviously like the pop, the soul ballad, there's R and B to it. But I was mm-hmm. like, I was hearing Queen more than I thought. I was hearing Dolly oh. Parton. I was hearing Mary J. Blige. Like, there's so many other things going on in that, yeah. uh, in what she did on that album. Um, so yeah, I, I I think for me it's got to be Adele's 21. As I'm thinking about like what kind of epitomized that year, um, and also was just like would have the standing impact in music from that year. I, it, that it's, that's gotta be it for me, like personally nice. and also just industry wise. Nice. Yeah. And you already touched on most of my honorable mentions. Uh, I've got St. Vincent on here. Her strange, that, that strange mercy album is kind of where I was introduced to her. Yeah. And, um, I, even if I don't love it, I'm always really interested to see, you know, what she's doing. She also had an album out earlier this year that was really, really good. I wasn't mm-hmm. super duper into it, but man, the, the love put into that album deserves to be. She breaks recognized. your brain, man. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> the, she could literally do any genre of music yeah. and you can't say that about a whole lot of artists. Well, okay. Not a whole lot of artists can do any genre of music. Well, 
Right. That's true. She, yeah. <laughs> she can. Um, and yeah, that strange mercy album definitely deserves uh, a mention. Uh, I think the only ones on here that you did not mention were, it was the one that I eventually went with for my number one, um, which I'm not going to mention just yet. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a Radiohead album this year, not the greatest Radiohead album, but King still of Limbs, one of the, it? yes, okay. King of Limbs came out, um, in retrospect, an amazing album, but didn't really have a whole lot of impact the year that it came out. Okay. Um, we also have probably my favorite Foo Fighters album that year in Wasting Light. Wasting Light. Yeah. Um, that's, that was kind of a contender. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only other one on here is my uh, number one, which is actually the Bon Iver self-titled oh. album, the, the second full-length album. Um, and ultimately, um, after going back and listening, and you know, trying to use that that idea of okay, which of these artists are being as forward-thinking with their music as, as possible, mm-hmm. I ended up giving it to Bon Iver, uh, for that reason. And that, that I had to figure out how I was going to consistently pick a number one for each right. year. And right. again, that, that being the running theme, uh, I'm going with Bon Iver on that one, but I, it, it's hard to argue against Adele. And I don't, <laughs> I'm not even sure that we should, we might just no. leave it as is. I'd yeah, be like, I think, you know, this is your pick, this is my pick. Yeah. Let's enjoy them and leave it as it is. <laughs> I think I think that's how it should be, especially because um, you know, we're gonna have our own criteria for these sorts of things. And of course. And, and it's it's definitely similar how we're approaching this. Um I think that like weighing the the personal and the like cultural yeah. impact balance was a tough thing for me for sure. Like there's definitely albums on this mm-hmm. where I'm like, if this was my Liam number one album of the year, like it mm-hmm. would probably be different from a lot of these picks, but mm-hmm. like ultimately it's like what moved me and also yeah, exactly. moved the world. And I think you're, you're doing the same thing. And so yeah, I think we should just have have our two picks, and I don't think we need to slog cool. it out. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Also, you know, especially the further we go back, your favorite album for that entire year might be something that I've never even heard. So, Possibly. yeah, <laughs> keep you know what I mean. Keeping it to you know what's what's impacted us as well as making that large external impact, I think is yeah is a great when uh, I saw when I saw wasting light on the list, I was like. Uh, I think that might be Adam's pick. <laughs> <laughs> it was in consideration. It honestly was. I really, it's a good but, one. It, but then it was like, okay, it's a it's a great great album, and again, probably my favorite Foo Fighters album. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're talking about the full album experience, right. but like, did it really innovate? You know what I right. mean? Like, right. was it really forward thinking? Like, it was cool. There's a lot of really cool songs on it, but yeah. I think. Ultimately, it was just a great Foo Fighters album and didn't necessarily make a big impact in the music world. Right. It, it didn't change the way music sounded. You know what I mean? It was just a great rock and roll album. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, you you want to take us back up? to 2001? Let's do it. 2001. I was a young man in college. Um, living away from home for the first time, mm. uh, had my first kind of like real, real job. I was working at, uh, Newbury comics, which, you know, w- working at a record store. I mean, obviously yeah, comic books and other silly stuff too, but you know, primarily a comic book and, and, um, CD and record store. Yeah. Um, when you work in, a record store with other music fans, you get exposed to a lot of new music very, very fast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, and not besides that fact, 2001 was a bonkers year for music. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Um, Like most of these years, I have like five, maybe six honorable mentions if I'm getting crazy. I've got 10 honorable mentions for 2001 aside from my top pick. 
Um, and the top pick for this year was very, very difficult. Maybe the most difficult one aside from this year. All right. Um, but you know, so we've got, you all know how I feel about spoon. Yeah. Um, girls can tell came out in 2001, a hugely impactful album for them. And for myself, we've got the strokes with their debut album, Massive. which arguably changed the yeah. sonic landscape of rock music and indie everyone sounded like the strokes for five years after that yeah. album came out. <laughs> so um you have to mention the strokes um wilco uh yankee hotel foxtrot came out it was almost like their rebranding yeah and um it did kind of open the door for a lot of that <sighs> yeah you could tongue in cheek you could call it dad rock but it's just really kind of that more introspective um, chill, uh, emotional rock and roll. And, uh, that, that album still, you can go back to it and still be moved by it and affected by it. Um, I've got destiny child, destiny's child on mm, here. We, we talked about, De yeah, we talked about destiny's child recently and, uh, that is probably their biggest album. Maybe and I, I like writing on the writings on the wall better. That's mm -hmm. got like bills 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 and stuff but this is when they kind of found <laughs> their this this is when you're getting bootylicious this is when you're really getting into yeah. like what what destiny's child became but yeah um yeah well they were huge that year oh yeah and um absolutely deserves a mention um i've got radiohead on here again <laughs> um amnesiac came out this year um i've got a few on here that are kind of outliers um, but I think definitely deserve a quick mention. Um, uh, Bjork came out with Vespertine that year. Um, I think that's one of her best albums, and I think it kind of goes under the radar sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're actually a Bjork fan. Um, Sigur Rós had their... Oh. Uh, I, it's actually uh, not their first album. I thought it was for the longest time, but this was kind of when they really got huge. Um and I'm not even going to pretend to know how to pronounce it, so I won't even try. But um, and they're actually um, uh, VMP is uh, their their album for the month uh, for their members in January is a new pressing of that album. So I'm oh, I'm like man. oh I just might as well just sign up even if I just cancel it after that just to make sure I can get that. Um, but yeah, what I I fell in love with that album that year, and it was just. That that literally was the album that made me go out and buy a violin bow for my electric guitar. Like, like oh my I want to, <laughs> I want to make mechanical whale sounds with my guitar too. Like, <laughs> it was cool. Um, just kind of created a new sound. Um, Daft Punk is on here with Discovery, um, arguably one of their best, if not their best, uh, probably their best in my uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, to have a, a EDM album with that level of impact, um, definitely deserves a mention. Yeah. Um, and then last but not least for the outliers, uh, I put sparkle horse on here and, um, that it's a wonderful life album. Um, that was one of the ones that I heard it for the first time in the record store where I was working in Newbury comics and, I was like, what, what is this? Like, it was incredibly depressing, but like devastatingly beautiful at the same time. And I think that was the first time I had heard anything like that. Um, so that, that's one of those albums that I think pressings of that album go for 200, 300 plus dollars. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 Jeez. A, yeah, it's one of those, <laughs> And it's it's really really good. It's really it's kind of hard to describe, um, but if if you like, you know, Radiohead or it's not even Radiohead isn't a very good comparison. They're kind of hard to describe. Um, he's kind of got that whispery voice, and everything sounds like he's in so much pain. But there's some songs on that album where they're actually kind of like you're, t you're tapping your foot at the same time while you're hearing mm. these, you know, sometimes really strange and, and, and depressing lyrics. But, um, it's, it's definitely one of my favorites for the year. I at least had to mention it. Cool. Um, I'm actually going to hold off on my number one 
Okay. That I haven't I haven't mentioned yet until okay. we hear yours first. I want to try to keep it kind of fun. So, All right. uh, what what was your 2001 like? Well, yeah. So, I mean, the Strokes album was huge. Um, I I strongly considered that, but um, didn't didn't win out for me. If we were going in line with just solely what was the most important album to me that year, it was probably Bleed American by Jimmy Eat World. Oh. I I'm a massive Jimmy Eat World fan that I was like in a crummy high school rock band at the time. And that was one of those albums nice. when I, when I heard it and I was like, Oh no, now this is what we're going to play. You know, we were yeah, playing green we're day sound songs. Like this yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing green day songs anymore guys. We're doing Jimmy Eat World. Um, and then, uh, Songs in A Minor by Alicia Keys. I yeah. don't know if you remember seeing that music video, uh, yep. but I, I distinctly remember watching it thinking like, I there's nobody else that's making this music right now, at least not on mm-hmm. MTV. And you knew, again, you knew you were seeing a star. Like, yeah. I had that feeling that, Oh my God, this is the first song of 50 songs that I'm going to hear and know and enjoy and possibly love by this artist. Mm-hmm. Um, just like the birth of a powerhouse. Um, For sure. But yeah, I didn't, again, like most of my albums are, most of my picks are going to be things that are a little bit more established. I think Adele, that her, that's her second album, is like the only one on my list that's not pretty deep in the catalog. Um, Mm -hmm. so I, I didn't go with any of those, uh, for mine. Uh, Do you want me to, you want me to, to kick mine? Sure. Go for it. So I went with Jay-Z's blueprint. Um, so you have, I mean, it's probably his best. I, I, it's his best album. Um, (laughs) it, it hits at the right point in like his trajectory where like, Uh He had gotten so big, album six, he's rapping, he'd always been rapping about, like, coming from the streets and coming up, and now it's, like, defined. Like, he actually has all the money that he's talking about, and no one can touch him, and you had, like, Jada Kiss and Nas and all these people who were, like, Mm -hmm. going at him, and he puts one diss track on the album, he annihilates them, the guy is at the top, (laughs) the top of his form, um, yeah. he's got an absolute banger in there with Izzo, like H to the Izzo. I was like yep. on every radio, uh, everyone crazy. Knows that song. Yeah. Yep. And no features except for the, the one who, the, an artist who almost never features on albums, Eminem Renegade is mm-hmm. fantastic. I could listen to Renegade over and over again. It's, it's, it's a banger. Um, yeah. and you, you have like Kanye West just like, establishing him like this is one of those early moments where you're like the production on this album Kanye's early production Mm -hmm. uh on this album gelling with like Jay-Z at his absolute prime pinnacle moment um it's kind of nuts (laughs) it it felt it feels effortless and the crazy thing is like when you when you hear stories about how he works like a lot of his albums get cut pretty quickly. Like he just goes in. Um, they talked about this at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where he like would just go in and lay it down. There's not a whole mm-hmm. lot of, of 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 like do overs and working through stuff or whatever. And maybe he's doing that on the front end, but like he he just goes in and is is undeniable and sometimes he stinks like there's later times when it's just like he goes in and you're like man that kanye song monster where like Nicki minaj just established herself um she puts jay-z to shame in that in that song it's crazy um but that's years later yeah this this is just this is incredible and and kanye's his his like handiwork behind the scenes his samples it's so good um I, you know, there's like a Timbaland song on here that's pretty good. I feel like that's probably like the weakest one for me. Maybe I was like kind of played out on Timbaland. I, I like Missy mm. Elliott. I like Busta Rhymes. Like I like some of that like era yeah. of hip hop a lot. But definitely this like, I don't know, this this kind of redefined it. I also remember like being 
annoyed with Diddy, Puff Daddy, <laughs> for all of like for the way that he approached sampling. Right, it was like uh, not creative enough for me, I guess, or not. It, there wasn't like any sort of insightful. You're not standing on the shoulders of giants. Maybe you're just like throwing records around, and then you listen to this album, and it's it, it it's like woven like early hip hop was where it's just like uh-huh. there's a there's a master behind the scenes and then there's a master on the microphone. Yeah. Um so yeah, Blueprint, I mean so great that he released awesome. two more Blueprints after the fact. Uh <laughs> right. they're also good, but you you can't replicate the first one. Yeah. Wow. Very what about cool. You? Uh okay, well my number 1 and this was again, this was probably probably the most difficult for me other than this year. Um, I ultimately landed on Gorillaz. Wow, nice. Self-titled Gorillaz album, their first first album. Um, what a complete, just mind-blowing yeah. moment. Uh, what is this with band? that album? Yeah, it's it's so just multi-genre. Uh, multicultural, like it's, it's, you, they hit everything. You've got Miho Hattori on there doing her thing. And I was, I was already, you know, a big Chibomato fan mm-hmm. and a uh, fan of her work. And, you know, Damon Albarn, you know, I'd already been a huge Blur fan and his solo stuff. And, you know, all of the, the, the hip hop Del, features, Dell the funky Homo sapien, like, right? Del, yeah, like yeah. I, I went out and bought Dell's album ah. after that because it was so good. Yeah, uh, Del Deltron Thirty Thirty. I went out mm-hmm. and bought it that year after because I was so obsessed with that Gorillaz album and I just wanted more. Um, and that got me into the whole like I got into like Dan the Automator and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Like that that was that was what was new and really really fresh that year. So. For me, that that was the most forward-thinking album for the year because just the constant collaboration, the you know, the whole the whole concept that you know you didn't know who the band was unless you really researched it because they presented it as if it was this fictional band. Mm-hmm. It was like you know, it was almost like the 2001 version of the Monkees or something. Yeah. It was like you know what well, I mean. You watch that music was, video and you're like, what am I seeing? What yeah, is this? it's a cartoon. Yeah, it's not he's, real. He's got no pupils. There's zombies. Yeah. There's <laughs> like, and and I know this voice, but I can't place it. Yeah, yeah. so paradigm huge, shift. Huge Gorillas fan to this day, and love you know their whole catalog. But you know this kicking it off in such a you know monumental year for so many different ways uh, reasons um, uh, that you know w- once I decided on it. I was like, oh yeah, there was no like going back and forth once I, you know, really figured it out and and decided on it. It was like that's the obvious pick for yeah, at least yeah. for me. <laughs> so, um I'd be remiss if I did not mention that another album that came out this year that Dan specifically requested that I mention is mm. Free All Angels by Ash. Ash. Oh my gosh. Yes, and I was like Dan, you are correct, and I yeah. will absolutely mention that for you. You know, I, they didn't really go anywhere after that, but um, yeah, that was that was big for me that year, at least. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember. I have that. I still have that on CD somewhere. It's a pretty. Yeah, good it's album. a great yeah. album. Yeah. Um, you want to take a break before we uh, yeah. really, really go back to you know pre nine eleven. Yep. world pre uh you know pre pubescent for some of us maybe yeah definitely. <laughs> uh, so let's uh let's let's take a quick break and we'll come back on side b uh with another just crazy year for insane music. year yeah. 1991 yeah we'll be right back
are back. The special end of year edition of Retro Groove. And um, we are hopping pretty far back in the Wayback Machine now. Mm-hmm. Um, I was probably, I was nine years old in 1991. Um, I know uh, you and I just kind of touched on this year and what was maybe going on in our lives at that point in yeah. the uh, Retrologic uh, Game of the Year podcast. Um, but 1991 uh, is pretty memorable for me. Uh, that's also right around the time where I had a pretty big life shift. Um, you know, we were in Arizona and I had been in Arizona since I was born. Um, we were on vacation visiting grandparents on the East Coast mm-hmm. when our house in Arizona was struck by lightning and halfway burned to the ground. Insane. So, and, and this was August. So it was like, well, we don't have a house to go back to. So my dad went back to take care of that. I started fifth grade. Wow. And we ended up just staying there. Insane, um, dude. It just like, made, you know, it just, the circumstances of everything, it just kind of made sense. That's like a sliding so, doors or whatever. Like that is that like the lightning struck and it changed yeah, your life forever. It changed the entire, it changed the whole direction of my entire life. Who knows, Insane. you know, what, what would have happened and where I would be. Yeah. But um, humongous year for music. Crazy. Um, just, yeah, there were memes just, about it earlier this year, right? Like, I think it was September when it was like you had a, a few albums all stacked up, cassette tapes all stacked up, where it's like these all, all these albums came out within 30 days of each other. And yeah. it was some of the most important albums in alt, grunge, metal, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, everything. Hard rock. So yeah. completely nuts. And it would, it, we could spend multiple episodes hashing out 1991. Um, but I'm just going to list off a few that I have. You can fill in whatever you've got, uh, and then we'll talk about maybe some outliers and some Mm -hmm. favorites. Um, so you can't talk about music in 1991 without talking about Nevermind. Right. Um, and I'd mentioned this recently and I'm not just like trying to be a hipster or whatever, but it's, it's really not my favorite Nirvana album. Um, I do enjoy Nirvana. Um, but for some reason, this album didn't really capture me. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't really a big Nirvana fan until In Utero came out, and I love that album. So if I'm like in the mood to listen to Nirvana, uh, 99 times out of 100, I'm going to put on In Utero. So, um, but obviously, you know, once that music video hit MTV, the world changed. Yeah. So you know, grunge took over from that moment on. Um, and so, you know, we've also got Soundgarden this year. We've got Smashing Pumpkins with their album Gish, Gish. which I really, really loved. It's and a it's good one, one of my favorites. Um, REM had a huge album that year with Out of Time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, another really big one for me this year was the self titled Cypress Hill album. Oh, wow. Um, and I will still go back to that album this day. And you can listen to that whole album. It is a phenomenal album. Um, uh, and then, uh, my last kind of big one, that's not either an outlier or, you know, my, my number one, uh, is going to be the low end theory. Yeah. uh, Tribe called quest. Yeah. Um, I remember putting that on in the record store and, uh, you know, there's some there's some mm, what you might call inappropriate lyrics on that album. Oh, yeah. And so I still have this, you know, you know, the when you have those moments, you it's usually when you're trying to fall asleep and you have like these cringy or embarrassing memories that try to pop up to the those mm-hmm. intrusive thoughts like, oh, remember when you did this and it was really embarrassing. Yeah. So I, I remember putting the low end theory on in the record store and there, it was just me and, and a female coworker, and she was like, um, can we change this to something <laughs> else? Like, this is making me uncomfortable. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Sure, put on. You know what? I know it's my pick, but put on whatever you want. Just go yeah. ahead. Like, you, yeah. <laughs> I felt so bad. I didn't even think, you know what I mean, twice about it. But um, phenomenal album for them. Um, it may be one of their definitely one of their best probably yeah. their most well-known it's probably their most well-known although like i feel like 
Can I Kick It is such a big song that's on their first album. Yeah, a- that was like their first tour. big hit. Yeah, Award Tours on the third album, which is probably my favorite. I like Midnight Marauders a little bit better. Um, I, I, de- I, I saw Low, Low End Theory on the list, and I was like... That's fantastic. Like that. Yeah. That's such an important album and a, a, such a strong follow up uh, to. I think. I think it was like the year before uh, was uh, a people's instinctive travels. Like, mm-hmm. like it, it's crazy. Sometimes again, we get used to waiting three or four years often for some of our favorite artists to put out albums, and then when you look at some of these, and you're like, "Oh, oh my God. God, wow!" Yeah. They just like every <laughs> year for three or four years, they're they just, just knocking put out them out, bangers. Yeah, mm-hmm. how did they do that? Um, but when you're in it, you're in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think you hit most of mine. Um, Public Enemy had a had a great album that year as well. Oh, but yeah. mm-hmm. again, it was Apocalypse '91. There were I would say that there were better albums before that, um, but it's still a great Public Enemy album. And I think, like, that's kind of consistently for me um, everything that I saw in this year. Like, Nevermind was that for me, too. Like, and I'm going to have this in in 71 just as, like, a tease. Like, Nevermind should probably be the answer to this, like... Cause it is never mind, but <laughs> right. it's, but it's not it's not my pick, and it doesn't no. have to be yours, and so it can be somebody else's pick. Um, but like, if you look at like just impact on music, it it might be never mind. Um, but yeah, like, blood sugar, fair. sex, magic, <laughs> right? Yep. Like, I'm more of a Californication guy. Like, I'm not even a big Chili Peppers fan, but like, yeah, I'm not. I got in I got in more at Californication like I knew the songs but right. uh, I, I, tube socks no thanks you know like, not, <laughs> no. like I, I don't think so um I like Out of Time a lot obviously I'm an REM fan but yeah. I you know not the strongest album it's, it's not um, automatic for the people no like, you know what and, I mean it's a great yeah. album but yeah and then you have 10 by Pearl Jam, yeah, which true. probably is their best album. But I don't like Pearl Jam that much. <laughs> no, I really, I honestly don't. And I, I can't even really pinpoint why. Yeah. Um, objectively, yeah. they're, yeah, you have to respect it. And objectively, they're great. But I don't, I've, obvi- yeah. I bought 10 when it came out and kind of rarely listened to it. And it was just, I had it on CD. I, I'm just not a fan. That's all. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't yeah. hit me. Nothing about it hits me on a personal level. Um, um, I I would rather listen to uh, Eddie Vedder's version of uh, "Rain Over Me." Yeah. Oh um, my God, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would rather. Real. I'll pick that over any Pearl Jam song any day yeah. of the week. And um, and Bad Motor Fingers are good. Soundgarden album and yeah. I love Chris Cornell but it's not super unknown so no. like I, I'm not I can't choose that you know no. um, and and so for me I, there was as I went over back and forth over the list and again looking at these massive massive important albums the yep. only one that fit my criteria again of like personal impact and love for, but also um, industry and and like sonic impact is Metallica's self titled album, the Black Album. I, there I, you go. That album was it was my introduction to the band, which mm-hmm. I, I didn't hear it until years later. I mean, I was seven years old in 91. I was not buying Metallica. Albums. Yeah, you were. <laughs> Unless you but, had a cool older brother or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I had a cool friend who, when he was like, we were like 10 or 11, whatever sixth grade is. He had an older brother who had a ride the lightning cassette tape and ah. I thought the cover was cool, but we had no way of listening to the cassette tape at the time. Oh. <laughs> and so we we're like, all right, well, this band seems pretty sweet. And then I remember being at the wall and getting this album because I had heard Enter Sandman. And I was mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. okay, this is cool. And I can like be mad at my parents and listen to this. <laughs> and you listen to this album and it's so dynamic. It's yeah. so, it, it marries everything so well. Um, you know they're not the thrash band that they right. were they 
elevated their own sound. Um, they had a bunch of their fans that got pissed off about it because they were like, well, yeah. these guys sold out, <laughs> right? But yeah. this is a cover-to-cover cover album. There is not yep. a bad song on this entire album, which is crazy because there's like 12 songs on this, right? Yeah. It's, it's crazy because they had lost their bass player and had mm-hmm. to get a new bass player. I mean, he joined for Justice uh, Justice for All, but like this was the first like real outing with, with Newstead. Um, right. It's, it's so good. It just, even if you don't like metal, I remember when I was first, uh, dating my wife, she didn't listen to anything hard rock or whatever. And when she heard the names or she saw CDs rather by Metallica and Rancid in my like CD wallet, <laughs> she like had predetermined sounds like yeah. Metallica is going to be like Satan screaming. Right. <laughs> and, and Rancid is just going to be like punch you in the face. And it's not, it's like Rancid is cool dance hall punk. And yeah. Metallica is like really passionate, heartfelt hard rock. Like it is, yeah. it is so good. So I, I love this album. It holds up. It's probably the best metal album of all time. It, it's pro- it, it's one of the I think the one of the best rock albums of all time. And again, like you have so many songs. If you don't know Metallica, you still know half this album. You know Sad right. But True, you know Unforgiven, you know Nothing Else Matters, you obviously know Enter Sandman. Like yeah. this this entire album was just so it, it was everywhere. It it's so good. It's a good pick. Um yeah. I, I'm not even a Metallica fan and I'm like, dang, that's a good <laughs> that's yeah. a good pick. Um, for all the reasons you described, um, I've got a couple of outliers here and I'm, I'm going to double down on the, the hipster mindset for this year and pick one of my outliers, one of my oddballs as my number one album for the year. Um, cause I'm also trying to be consistent and go with what I felt like was the most forward thinking. Yeah. Um, so the two that I, had as both my kind of oddball outliers. Cypress Hill was a little bit of an outlier, but that was a pretty big album that year. It was year. big, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, can, I still have memories of me and my friends, you know, singing Cypress Hill songs in the hallway at school in that the nasally <laughs> cadence. Um, but I've got Slint. Uh, they released Spiderland that year. Okay. And, you know, that heavily impacted me and got me... Uh, started on my descent into the whole post rock world, um, which I still am a huge, uh, huge fan of. You know that they opened the door for bands like Explosions in the Sky and Mogwai, mm-hmm. and you know without without Slint, they just don't exist. Um, uh, you know, kind of had a moment um, when I finally a couple years ago got to see David Paho, who is one of the original uh, members of Slint. Um, play a solo show opening up for Mogwai here in Austin, and that was cool. that's a really major show for me. I, I can't, yeah. and we were like right in front. I was like, we made sure we got there early. It's like I don't care. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna pee now because I am not <laughs> moving from this spot. So I was like, we were front row, dead and center for for David Paho and Mogwai, and con- completely blew my mind. Uh, I think the only concert that blew my mind more so than that was actually getting to see explosions in the sky. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's just me being a huge post rock nerd. Um, but that's not my favorite for the year. My, my, my top album for 1991 actually goes to my bloody Valentine. Yeah. Uh, Loveless. They released Loveless. Yeah. And as, as weird as it is on the surface, the more you listen to it, you can you can like hear the '90s. Mm-hmm. It's like there's there's weird like kind of warbly out of tune things going on, or that at least sound out of tune at first. Um, there's some weird, just kind of almost non-song tracks that flow with the whole album, and it doesn't doesn't feel right to go to the next song without it. Um, just the the kind of soft the the wall of guitars with that teeny tiny soft whispery female vocal completely you know echoes 
what's to come yeah in in music uh for the next you know 10 years at least in that kind of world the indie and uh you know female fronted groups and stuff like mm-hmm. that um speaking of which random i just watched last night of a, a live video of veruca salt playing seether at a music festival oh man and i was like where are like we're talking about the year of the woman decade mm-hmm. of the woman whatever you want to call it it's like and i love it but like where where are these folks like where where's yeah. the new veruca salt and yeah. you, you know you could make an argument for groups like um uh illuminati hotties or something like that where they're a little bit more like snarling mm-hmm. um you can make an argument for bully but like i was i was watching that and i was like ah oh, the 90s were so freaking cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh my my pick for 1991 goes to my bloody valentine and uh I, I I have no shame in in my pick. I'm very no. I, in my I admittedly pick. <laughs> admittedly like I kind of, that one I kind of guessed out of all of these. Again, when I was looking through the list, I was like, all right, there's Adams. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, I made such a big deal out of it when I finally got the yeah. the vinyl version the vinyl. Early this year. Yeah. So, which. <sighs> I need to get my record player set up. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be, we're going to walk through all this stuff and you're like, man, I'm not going to be able to listen to any of this stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I think now we are getting 81. to the point where neither of us had uh, been yeah. born was not yet. alive. Yeah. Definitely not alive. Um, but considering when we were born, which is early eighties, mm-hmm. um, early to mid eighties, this music, you know, this is what was in the culture. It was what was on the radio. It's yeah. songs that we heard, you know, in our friends' cars, uh, going to get ice cream. It's what we heard at the bowling alley. Stuff just this was this music was still a huge part of our lives, even though it was technically released before we were born. Yeah. Um, so I've I've got six really solid picks here. Uh okay. with with one pretty clear favorite for me um but i kind of want to hear because you know i was born in 82 so i I probably in my waking life was a little bit more aware of it as it existed in the in real time i'm really curious to hear your your picks for this year yeah i mean this year was admittedly a tough one for me i mean like Mm -hmm. there there were definitely a few things that i recognized as important there were a few things that i do have a fondness for um but like so joan jett's i love rock and roll like i think that's a fantastic song it's a really good album but it's also like i don't know if it's the pick you know like i think if if it was if i was to pick like the song of 81 for me about what kind of embodies what i see 81 as it might be that it it might be that um i'm not a big rush fan but like i'm not moving moving pictures is the album by all accounts right Mm -hmm. um you know duran duran put out their first album i love duran duran but like I'm not big on their first album. No, their later albums, like the second and third albums are where it's at. Yes, exactly right. Um, You had Tattoo You by the Stones, which is huge, especially considering that they'd been doing it for decades at that point. Yeah. Um, And so for me, it it, like there's Beauty and the Beat by the Go-Go's, which is such an important album. And got that on here, too. A hundred percent definitely listen to that a bunch like with my mom like it was on the radio it was on mtv i remember that really clearly um but yeah it's not my final pick and again this is one where Mm -hmm. if we were trying to go for some sort of consensus i'm soft on this one Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably Ghost in the Machine by The Police. Yes, I, I am so happy that you mentioned that album. <laughs> okay, I like uh, my mom loves Sting. I was raised on The Police, uh, so I had that initial knee jerk. Eventually, like I, I, it, it's in my blood, and then mm-hmm. it's lame because it's, it's parent rock. And yeah. then, <laughs> and then like you get older, and you're like, oh no, actually that was pretty dope. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and 
it's not synchronicity, right? right? But it's really good. And I I am admit, admittedly like a huge Peter Gabriel fan yep. and the producer on this album worked a ton with with him and with Steve Lillywhite and like ju- you can feel the sound in the production um there's a lot of keys going on. Sting is playing saxophone on like half these songs. Um, but there's, I, I, it's not a cover to cover album for me. There's a few on here that I, there's like two or three songs on this album that I think are kind of duds. Um, mm-hmm. But for the most part, like what it is, you know, I, I'd say seven or eight of these songs are like hold up extremely well there's a song yeah. called omega man that is just yep, yeah <laughs> i love that song so much um but the, it should be this, said it yeah, should be ahead. said that it's it's nearly impossible to have an album where you don't have at least one or two songs that are kind sure. of you're kind of whatever about like very rare that you're yeah. like oh every single song on this album is is yeah, Blown but there's a water. there's a song on this one where Sting is singing in French and then talking about being hungry yeah. for you, and it just doesn't <laughs> work for me <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, but everything else is great. I mean, I, I, like diving into it a little deeper, like you can tell that this is the Sting show. It feels like the yeah. Sting show. The early police where things are a little more balanced, the production stripped back, but you, then you can really, like Andy Summers is such a great and distinctive guitar player. Um, he just doesn't shine on this as much as he does in other police songs because mm. there are all these other things going on. There's a lot of other textures, um, which he lends himself to, but... You know, it's like hearing an Oasis song and not getting that jangly, bouncy edge lick where I'm like, I could use a little more of the Andy. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, where, where, where is he? Like, you could shut I feel up, that. Sting. I feel that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that's my pick for, for, nice. for, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the only album of theirs that I actually own. Um, okay. It's, it's, Synchronicity is probably the best. I, I like I, the one after yeah. it, which I think is their last. I mean, that's yeah. I, I, I'm I'm sticking with Ghost in the Machine. Like, okay. <laughs> if I never own Synchronicity, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> to be totally honest, <laughs> that's fair. Um, but yeah, uh, great pick. Um, and that was up there for me. Honestly, I, that was in the running. Um, you mentioned the Go Go's, which are on my list. You mentioned Rush as well. Um. Uh, I'm going to also mention Black Flag. Mm. Uh, I have to touch on that for a second. This was damaged. Um, If I'm not mistaken, because I'm not super well versed on my Black Flag history, I believe it was their first with Rollins. Um, And it's, you know, it start off with Rise Above and it's like, holy crap. Like, you know what I mean? You either, you either get black flag or you don't and it's Mm -hmm. like dang it that's that's amazing you know blood boiling music that makes you want to get up and punch somebody in the face and if you're a little Um, afraid that's okay yeah that's yeah i think you're supposed to be be. yeah (laughs) i would yeah i would be a little bit more worried about you if you weren't at least a little bit afraid that's uh whether you admit it or not um, the only other one on here that's not my number one pick, I, I do think Phil Collins' face value mm-hmm. deserves to be mentioned. Um, you know, obviously, we also had a huge Genesis album that year. Yeah. But um, you know, even if we're just talking about in the air tonight, like let's just recognize Phil Collins' yeah. <laughs> accomplishment here. Um, amazing album. It sounds like the eighties. Um, uh, so does, that's why I have how I feel about Ghost in the Machine yeah, too. It does, is it like yeah. it sounds like you're being introduced to the '80s, like you're going through the Tron thing, and yep. you're like, you know, being digitized <laughs> yeah. into the digital world as you go. Yeah. But and hear me out. But Good. my number one album for 1981 is Business as Usual by Men at Work. Wow. And, Do and, tell. I f- I feel like unless you're you know old enough to be like around when it came out, Men at Work sounds like one of those joke bands that 
you know, they have the one song on the 80s mix and that's like it. But, yeah, but they have that, Colin Hay, right? Like, that album is yeah. so consistent. But and Colin Hay incredible. is a fantastic songwriter. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Every song on that album is super good. And it's a wonderful listen all the way through. Amazing song. I put them like on the same level as like Dire Straits. Mm-hmm. Um, they just, for, for whatever, I mean, that album sold ridiculous number of copies. I, I, I remember kind of being slightly embarrassed at one point having a discussion online, probably in some Reddit group. And I was like, that album is so underrated. And someone replied and was like, yeah, it went like platinum however many times. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, maybe I meant like underappreciated, at least in the modern day. Yeah. But it is absolutely uh, my top pick. It's such a great album. It sounds like the 80s, but not in like the kitschy, computery kind of way. Uh-huh. Um, and some amazing musicianship on that album. And it definitely gets my pick. Now, that has Down Under on it, right? Yep. So are you familiar with the Kookaburra stuff that went on? I mean, it was years ago now, but it was like... It, I mean, so we're talking about 81 yep. in in the 2000s at some point um the the band got hit with a lawsuit by the company that owns the rights to kookaburra are you familiar with the song kookaburra sits in the old gum tree sucks Have you ever heard it? i it's know like a, about it yeah i i mean it seems just like a nursery rhyme or something to me it doesn't seem like you know, it doesn't seem like something that somebody would own, but like right. <laughs> they sued the band like 30 years later what? and won, like won royalties. They serious? didn't, they didn't get a ton of money, but they legit, like, I remember that they definitely oh, okay. won it and got money from the band. Yeah. It's crazy. Jeez. Like how, how you do that 30, whatever years later is, is beyond I mean, me and why it took that long. <laughs> there's got, there should be some statute of limitations yeah. on that. I, yeah. I don't know if there is or not, but 30 years, like, come on, man. Yeah. There should be but, like a five, 10 year statute of limitations on that. But there's that flute part and it's, it's legitimately just the song like it's definitely the kookaburra song oh it's like the um, okay okay yeah. <laughs> i'll have to yeah you gotta you dig into it just it's a fun little rabbit yeah, i've never hole. heard you of get that into, right, yeah I'll it's, it's it a fun little sure. thing um but colin hay is a, a badass he Crazy. has had like a fantastic career since as just like a, a solo artist he was on the garden state soundtrack um oh wow i think he's done some other stuff with zach braff too and um he's been in like ringo's all-star band like oh, he's nice. out there and does a ton of stuff he is is legit i fully respect this pick and and colin hay is the real deal so uh yeah I'm all 15, in. 15 million copies sold worldwide. Amazing. That album. Yeah. Nuts. It's huge. Yeah. Um, okay. So this one, it, it may be our most kind of difficult yeah. to talk about because now we're really going back in time. Um, 1971. Mm-hmm. And this was, a you know, this, this feels like, you know, ancient history. It really wasn't, but... You know, especially seeing just kind of the watching that that get back docu series recently, yeah. and kind of just seeing you know the the late sixties, early seventies world as it was. You know, no one had a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything was analog. Basically, um, people just looked different, talked different. It it's like it's like we're a different race of people now. Right. Um, so it's interesting to go back and kind of listen to what was coming out of people's consciousness creatively um, at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of really, really interesting stuff starts to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got L.A. Woman yeah, coming you out. You've got Carol King with Tapestry. Yeah. Um, you've got Marvin Gaye with What's Going On. And it's like, these are just 
iconic albums. Cornerstones, yeah. And yeah. just be, I'm ba- I'm barely scratching the surface here, but um, uh, a big one for me is uh, Fragile by Yes, mm-hmm. and um, but that one was actually a top runner. That's for not me. your pick, and it's not my pick. It's my oh, runner up. Oh man, okay, I was but, sure um, it was your pick. Oh, it's it it, <laughs> it was in the running for sure. Um, yeah, that album is um, not the first progressive rock album, but I I think probably the first one to really make it a listenable album experience, but mm-hmm. still, you know, go down the rabbit hole and, you know, <laughs> through the looking glass and, and all of that, um, just is it all vaguely psychedelic, but, but in a, in a way that you're able to kind of hear what they're doing f- and get the message that they're trying to get across rather than mm-hmm. just like, being psychedelic for the sake of being psychedelic. Right. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense, but no, no. Yeah, for sure. It's how I feel about it. Yeah. Um, I've also got Van Morrison's Tupelo honey on here. Mm -hmm. I love that album. Um, and once again, I'm going to say, Oh, the only other one I'm going to mention is maggot brain by Funkadelic. Oh, by Funkadelic. Yeah. Yes. Because it is this. Now this is, I wouldn't call fragile a weird album. It's just progressive rock. Mm-hmm. Maggot Brain is a weird album <laughs> in in the best way, though. I yeah. mean, Funkadelic is Funkadelic. They are right. trailblazers and they're amazing. Maggot Brain has some, but it's not weird just for the sake of being weird. It was like weird with a message behind it. It's in another and universe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it, the and it paved the way for all of that. And yeah. um, I, I'll still go back and listen to that. To this day um but again i'm gonna save my top pick and i want to hear uh really interested to hear what you have to talk about for this yeah year. i mean so you had great albums by jackson five stevie wonder the carpenters you had the first albums by the doobie brothers first album by john prine um i think it, John, uh, John lennon's imagine is this year as well yeah. which is huge yeah um yeah, and then like you said, L.A. Woman, it, like the the culmination of the Doors. You basically have the end of that band this year. Um, and I, I, if again, if we were just going like my own personal, like just my preference, it probably would have been Nick Drake's Brighter Later. Um, mm. Pink Moon is the following year. That's the right. better known album. And then I think he dies right after that. But um, but yeah, no, that uh, brighter later is one of my favorites, um, and so there are three then for me that are the big ones, and there's one of these three that I personally went out. I it was one of the first like LPs that I ever just bought on my own at a used record store, like early early on like freshman year of college my roommate had a turntable as i mentioned before he had the white album and we were listening to piggies and stuff and i was like all right i gotta go out and i gotta get like some other stuff because i like this is a cool album but i need other things (laughs) yeah um so so first of all so sticky fingers came out that year right and I feel like that's a Stones album that everybody has a copy of. There's fantastic songs on it. I am not the Stones aficionado, so no. it does not get my pick. But yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of them anyway. To be completely honest, yeah. like I recognize their achievements and their contribution. Yeah, but it's the Stones. I, yeah. I don't go listen to them or anything. Right. Not the. Not like I listen to the. You know, I don't even own a single Rolling Stones record. Not that I wouldn't, but like. It's not my thing. It's not yeah. something I would really put on over the Beatles or something like that. Yeah. But that's me. That's just my opinion. They're they're and, objectively great. And then there's this year's Nevermind, which is Led Zeppelin's four. Yep. Which probably is that Nevermind for them? I mean, I think so. Isn't that Stairway? That's Black Dog. Like, yeah, I that is like, Stairway. Yeah, I feel like that album is the ultimate definition of what that band 
was... Oh, uh, yeah. I see what you're saying. It I, wasn't really their breakthrough, though. No, it's not their breakthrough. You're right. Um, but I just feel like it's the year's undeniable album, maybe. But and it's weird, because I, I like hard rock, and I really like Tolkien. I like Lord of the Rings, yeah, and there's absolutely some Misty Mountains jam on this. Yep. Love it. But it's not my pick. Like I I I like Led Zeppelin. I will sometimes listen to Led Zeppelin. If it's on the radio, I won't turn it off. Yeah, absolutely. I have this like I again, I feel like it's something I could break if I tried, but I have <laughs> this kind of associative issue with them where it's just like they're a little obnoxious to me. And <laughs> <laughs> they're his like, voice can get to be a bit much. And I think it's the audience thing too. I mean, like, yeah, it I've, could be. I've known some really annoying Zeppelin hits. <laughs> like, I just <laughs> so so. My pick is going to be "Who's Next" by The Who. Ooh, I I, I, knew, I knew you were going to bring it up. Love this album. I nice. love this album. Again, it is. I I bought like a Herbie Han- Hancock uh, album, and I bought this and. I don't even remember what the other one was. I remember buying three used LPs for like 10 bucks at a a store in the city to play on my roommate's turntable. And this is one of them because I knew almost all the songs on this from from growing up. Um, It is so good. Um, They have such a great catalog of music. Obviously, this has Baba O'Reilly on it, which is one of their biggest songs. Um, But... You know, I, I've gone through the catalog before. There's lots of great stuff. I like Who's Next a lot. Tommy's mm-hmm. great. You know, there's there's really great stuff. But this album is just such a banger. It is an awesome rock album with fantastic production. It is tight, but like there's seven minute long songs on this thing. Like there's like yeah. it, it, <laughs> it, it, it. Can you me- meander and also be tight? I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's weird. So this album that basically describes yes. So yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, this album is like the leftover reimagining of another rock opera. So they like mm. did Tommy and then they were going to do this thing called Lifehouse, and they messed around with it and the whole thing, like the wheels came off. And so then they were like, well, we got to go into the studio and record something. Let's make an album. And so they kind of like took the scraps of this opera and took the best parts, but focused on it like it was a rock album and not like this thematic art piece. And Mm -hmm. I think what wound up happening is the perfect marriage of the two, where you do have these grandiose ideas and this intricate production and, like, new things that are happening in the music, but it's Mm -hmm. still a killer Who album. Um, So, yeah, I I mean, like, Roger Daltrey sounds fantastic. I love Pete Townsend, huge Pete Townsend fan. Um, So I got to go Who's Next. That is a very, very solid pick. And I definitely had a feeling that you were going to bring it up because I th- think you've brought it up before, but um, uh, I'm I'm surprised that it's your top pick, but it makes sense mm-hmm. and got to respect that. Um, my top album for 1971 um, ended up being Hunky Dory by David Bowie. Yeah. And I think even Bowie said that this was like his turning point album to that defined him as an artist. You know, you've got changes, mm-hmm. uh, Oh, you pretty things life on Mars, which kind of sets up the whole Ziggy stardust universe. Um, kooks, uh, Andy Warhol, like this, this album, like it, it, it paves the way for the rest of his career yeah. and establishes, establishes him as kind of something different. You know, this might be the first quote unquote alternative album. Um, You could make an argument for that, I think. And, um, you know, talk about forward thinking. If there was anybody forward thinking in the music world, it was David Bowie. So um, that's my pick. And um, I think we, I think we pretty much touched, I mean, there's, there's, 
we, we don't have enough time to touch on everything that deserves to be touched on, but mm-hmm. I think we hit, you know, some of the biggest and, um, most impactful and most memorable. Um, but man, just here, here, I'm, I'm so glad that we didn't really discuss, we discussed yeah. what we were going to do, but we didn't, we didn't talk about artists at right. all. Right. And going Didn't into this blind... Didn't even give each other hints or anything. No, yeah. no. Yeah. And I almost, I almost kind of did. I tried to, I almost, I had something I was going to, but I was like, no, I'm not going to send it. I'm just going to, I'm yeah. just going to let it happen. Let's go cold. And um, so I'm really um, happy with our picks. Yeah. And there, there's not a, there's not a single one of these picks of, for either of us that I'd be like, well, you know what I mean? I think mm-hmm. we... Um, laid out our arguments and yeah. it makes it makes sense and uh I, this was I, I can't wait to do it next year yeah and go back to 2012 2002 like 92 this is gonna be it's gonna be nuts but yeah. um but happy new year happy, happy new year new everybody year. <laughs> i hope that we can get back to live music Mm-hmm. Uh, again because <laughs> it kind of came back and now it's kind of oh it's going away again hope we can um, get vinyl records in the stores yeah hope great. we can if if we can get that that uh acetate manufacturing plant back i think <laughs> we'll be in a much because there's plenty of pressing plants yeah because uh, i don't think it was so much the ability to press it i i literally think it's a it's a supply Material. chain issue yeah. Um, yeah, that, 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 uh, acetate plant burning down just killed it. Yeah. Uh, and COVID certainly didn't help and it certainly wasn't Adele's fault. Right. <laughs> so right. Let's, let's not blame the woman for all yeah. of this guys. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah. but any final thoughts? I think we've, um, pretty much hit what we intended to, to hit here. Yeah. No, I think that this is great. I think that, um, again, like we went through these years and found a, a nice balance here. Uh, yeah. I, I think that of everything that we mentioned, anyone that's listening probably has strong opinions uh, about other releases, maybe stuff that we didn't even touch on. And that's good because you're supposed to have yeah. personal relationships with music. And I look, I the Grammys exist for a reason and it's fine and it's good that they exist and, and it is what it is. Um, but I, I don't think that you ever need to just set, uh, a a number one or establish a number one and have it be the end all be all, you know, this is the time of year where everybody puts out their lists for the best albums of 2021. And I, I do like looking through those to see what I missed yeah. Um, I rarely will be focused on like what landed at one, what landed at two, what landed at three. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just scroll through and I'm like, wait, what is this? I've never heard of this before. How, how did I miss this? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, I don't think that the purpose here was to fully make some sort of everlasting etched in stone determination, right. but I think that, you know, taking the time to dig through these years and explore what made each of them um, special. I mean, the albums that we talked about, the artists that we talked about ranged across nearly all genres. Yeah. And um, I, I, it's, it's cool to have um, that, that kind of like mosaic of, mm-hmm. of musical influences that we can talk about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um I, listener, I uh, invite you to come and discuss your favorites for these years with us um, on the Retro Groove channel, uh, which is under the Retro Logic um, Discord Mm -hmm. server. And tell us what you agree with, what you disagree with, uh, something that we missed that deserved to be mentioned. Uh, We'd love to uh, talk with you all about it. Um, But other than that, I'm... Uh, really happy to have made it through this year and uh, hoping for a, a, a good 2022. And I'm excited to see what, uh, you know, we've, we've got a, a spoon album on the horizon. We've got some, some other interesting stuff uh, on deck. Um, but I think coming out of 
uh, you know, the second full year of a pandemic is among other global crises. I think we're going to have a really interesting musical year. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I think so. And too. if nothing else, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, Liam, thanks for, for, for hashing it out here with me and, and going through all of these. Yeah, man. It was a good time. And thank you for listening to Retro Groove. We're part of the Retrologic Network. Check out the website at retrologic.games for social links, merch, community, and more. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you.